Welcome back. This is Joel, and in this video, we'll actually be looking into uh, a very interesting technology, one of the newest technology, which is the ST Access, right? It is uh, more like the Cisco's SDN solution for uh, the the enterprise networks, right? So, <clears throat> just to make a map about what we will be discussing, right? Uh, it's going to be a purely a theory uh, kind of a uh, session. Uh, there won't be any lab involved like my other videos. Uh, but I've been getting quite some requests on, you know, talking about this. So I thought, let me put up a video with all the knowledge which I have about this solution. Uh, right. So, great. So what we'll be discussing is, uh, we'll probably start with uh, thinking on the lines of why why do we need this, right? Why do we need a STA solution, right? What is STA and why do we need it? We'll talk about the various components, right, of uh, my... STA, right? Then we will talk about uh, some of the key concepts which I would, uh, uh, which which we would all need to understand uh, uh, the STA solution, right? Uh, <clears throat> the next part would be talking about uh, probably we'll we'll talk about the fabric, right? Or the overlay network. We'll talk about fabric. You'll understand what is fabric, right? When I go to that, so we'll talk about fabric, and then uh, we will talk about how the wired and the uh, wireless network or the wireless uh, you know communication basically um, happens right or uh, how these devices are onboarded on uh, how the mobility works and all of that and finally probably we'll also do kind of like a packet um, you know flow or we'll, we'll trace the packet right uh, through the fabric and try to understand you know what's what's actually happening right so this is going to be our agenda uh, for the my bad right so this is going to be my agenda for you know for probably in the I'm not sure if I can finish all of this in a single video but that's going to be my agenda for SD access right awesome so let's start right so I think SDN has been around for some time now right you probably would have already heard about SDN um, software defined network where you kind of decouple the control plane from the data plane right probably every single person you talk to would have given you the same definition right I'm not going to give something new either, right? So that's that's SDN, and different um, companies or different vendors are implementing SDN, you know, in different ways, right? And there is no right way or the wrong way, right? It's it's just purely customized solution which vendors are providing, right? Now, if you look at just Cisco, uh, you see there are various tracks, right? If you look at ACI, right? So ACI was kind of like the SDN solution for your data center network right uh, similarly we had um, uh, which one van right for the van network right Cisco recently make a made an acquisition of Viptela to kind of like uh, provide you the SD van solution right and uh, <clears throat> I would basically place my SDA over here right because it actually gives you kind of like a SDN solution over a LAN network right so that's basically what we are trying to discuss today okay now, <clears throat> while we are here, let's also talk about some of the key challenges, right? Key challenges where in my, um, you know, enterprise network, right? Some of the key challenges. The first thing which comes to my mind is basically, um, you know, many customers find it very difficult to kind of like segment their network, right? Segmenting the network, uh, many people do it in different ways, right? People, yeah, some, some people use VLAN, some people use IP subnets, but this is really hectic and you have to really do it on every single device, right? Very, very uh, mundane work. Second thing is uh, manage, right? It's very difficult to manage, uh, you know, enterprise networks nowadays because again, like I said, uh, there are a lot of users who are moving in and out the network. There are complex uh, interactions, a lot of multiple touch points, right? And the other one is, uh, I would say, um, you know, uh, there is like, it's it's pretty slow uh, or slower issue resolution, right? Um, slow, let me put it as a resolution here. So if you, if there's some breakage in your network, it takes quite some time to figure out what has gone wrong and kind of like troubleshoot it and fix. Because again, you have, imagine you have the wired and the wireless networks, right? In an enterprise network. So these are some of the challenges. Now, across, um, uh, <coughs> 
I mean, and then you always have across industries, you know, there are other kind of like vertical challenges, right? Um, across industries, which you would have heard in terms of scale, right? You would have heard about cost and uh, maybe security, right? These are your evergreen challenges. They are there across, you know, um, uh, segments or like across, you find it in data center, you find it in your service provider, you find it in WAN network, LAN network, you find it everywhere, right? So I wouldn't classify them to be very specific of your, uh, you know, enterprise challenges, right? But you have them, right? Scale reason because there are going to be billions of devices uh, connected like I think it was close to 30 billion devices by 2020 right uh, cost every every company every customer wants to reduce the OPEX right network operations cost so that's a huge challenge and last one being security right uh, there are like new defects being uh, found day in and day out right new bugs being uh, registered and you always need to be uh, on the top of your game to kind of like keep your network secure right so these are some of the most important challenges which you would find you know in an enterprise network this is where sda comes into picture right <clears throat> the first interesting thing which i want to talk about sda is my uh, you know identity based uh, policies or identity based segmentation right it's it's all identity based you don't hear uh, so sda right the first thing is your identity Right, you no longer, uh, you know, hear people talking about uh, what VLANs or subnets or IP subnets, right? It's all identity based, right? Or a username John logs into the network, right? And now we can create ACLs or we can create those policies based on, based on literally, you know, uh, the uh, the identity of the user rather than you know uh, making the policies all stick to the IP addresses which we used to do till now, right? The second thing is automated network fabric, right? There's a lot of automation here. What I mean by automation here is this, uh, <clears throat> as a quick example is that, you know, when, whenever I have a new device getting added to my, you know, enterprise network, right? There's a lot of provisioning which has to normally happen, right? You have to go and configure the VLANs on it. You have to configure your, uh, what else? Uh, your probably your underlay or, uh, you know, uh, routing protocols on it and so on right all of this is manual work now imagine you are adding hundreds of devices it's going to be a huge amount of manual work but here you know in case of your dna you you can kind of like provision all of these devices which are getting to your network at a click of a button so it's automated you know network fabric right and also later we will also see how you know the wired and the wireless network are getting unified right that's another interesting piece which i want to show you as well as part of this and uh, probably the third thing is maybe your you know insights part right i mean right now yes i agree with you there probably are a lot of you know uh, uh, vendors which are doing the insights thing they are you know probably independent vendors there are you know big uh, companies doing it you know but this <clears throat> having both the analytics you know and the actionable insights right part of your user experience so that's something you know pretty interesting of uh, you know sta uh, as well and you get to see that a lot you know in the dnac center so dnac center is kind of like the whole huge controller right which sends, sits in your enterprise network where you can you know push your policies do any kind of management work and uh, the the insights portal also is residing here to um, kind of like you know give you um, everything like it gives you like a 360 view of your device it gives you 360 view of your clients which are connecting to your you know network and so on so that's really i think we are not going to concentrate much on the insights part in this section as well because like like i said earlier we are just trying to understand the technology you know from its core right great moving on so moving on what i want to talk is uh, probably Let's talk about the components, right? That's something which we told here is what we are going to do. So we are going to talk about the components of what? Let's go to components, it's right down here, right? So the components of STA. So let me actually kind of like, before that draw a very simple, you know, probably a campus fabric, right? Uh, let's probably draw a small cloud here, right? Let's put my devices, uh, this is going to be my um, you know, edge devices probably, right? Simple switch switches, and um, you know, you we can probably have a couple of important routers. Here. I mean, again, um, I, would, I would still 
these are <coughs> your cat devices so they can they are basically l2 l3 devices right they just have different functionalities in case of you know uh, sda right so that's something which i want and then probably let's put a router explicit router here and uh, yeah that's good i think that's it right so let's start naming them so let's start with the components right so when i say components what i mean is that you know sda solution has um, you know they have divided the roles of devices in the network right they have told okay so these devices are going to do these things right and that's pretty much um, you know uh, a flavor of stn isn't it like even in stn right you have um, a bunch of devices which you are going to name them or you're going to decide that they're going to do only data forwarding right whereas there are going to be certain other devices which are going to do all your control um, you know um, your, your control plane stuff right so something very similar in sda as well right so let's start with something very simple <coughs> so the edge devices right the edge nodes you can call these as the edge nodes so these are the devices here right these one so these are the devices where your actual what happens where your uh, you know uh, endpoint clients basically come and connect to your fabric right you can consider these to be your access devices or, or distribution as well if you have like a you know two tired core and stuff like that but more importantly this is the place where you know you have you're gonna have right your uh, you know probably a laptop getting connected or maybe a mobile phone getting connected right or sometimes you know you can probably have your access point as well right your access point also might get connected so this is the edge right this is your edge uh, side of the network so that's your edge node so first one was your edge node the second thing which we can talk about is what mm, let's talk about the uh, control plane node right so you see a router which i drew here right this one so let's call this as the control plane node right now what is this control plane node do so um, in case of sda what we are doing is we are actually using lisp right as the routing protocol right this has been there for uh, quite some time right it's um, um, it's it's been that probably for like seven eight years now it's been used mainly in the data center you know uh, area but uh, in case of my sda we are actually using lisp as my uh, routing protocol i'll talk about underlay overlay in a minute but before that you know uh, i just wanted to talk about the control plane node so this control plane node which is over here plays a very important part in my lisp right so lisp basically works in that way it, it kind of works as a mapping server right as a simple you know host database and it will map to kind of like the endpoint ids right uh, to a current location along with certain other attributes right and in simple terms you know your uh, your uh, database over here the, like the lisp database which i am talking about right will basically tell you will help you understand right which client is coming in right let's say this is client x right and this is the uh, edge node y right so lisp basically helps you understand okay x is connected behind y Right, so this kind of a mapping is kind of like maintained. Obviously, this is not, uh, you know, exhaustive. It's going to be more information like the IP addresses, the MAC addresses, and so on. But this is basically a simple representation of what's going to be there in your Lisp table. Right, so that's your control plane node. Right, next, so we have talked about two important components. The third part is your uh, border node. Right, I would go for your border node. So let's. Um, right so border node you can have single border node or multiple border node well, here i have you know used two right so this is your border over here right these both now what do they do they kind of provide um, you know as a entry or an exit point you know for your fabric right so the fabric is this this is your fabric right so i would say the fabric is basically all the whole network that kind of uh, you know exists between your edge and the border so that's your fabric now uh, border node is kind of like like i said it's going to provide a entry right inside or it's going to provide an exit for the fabric for the data traffic you know going in and out now there are again different types of uh, border nodes you can have kind of like an internal border node like if you're talking about um, you know connecting your uh, you know sda or your enterprise to probably a data center right so if you if you want only the traffic uh, you know to flow inside a data center your own data center then you can call that as a internal border node 
if it's a, um, a different kind of a network, you probably might have an external border node, you know, where this kind of opens up to the internet, right? Probably this is, you have your internet here, right? So, um, you know, you, you probably uh, want to connect this to the internet, then that would be an external border node, right? But uh, still the functionality remains the same. It's kind of like the entry point or exit point for your fabric, right? Hope that is good. What else? What else? What are other components, right? So we talked about edge. We talked about control plane node, control plane, right? A control node, you can say a control plane node. Then you talked about the border node, right? The other uh, couple of interesting pieces is my, um, there's actually another a router called as, you know, fusion router, right? Which would basically uh, live over here, I would say, right? Let's put it here. So it would basically have one of its leg connected to the, you know, border and probably the other side probably connected to a, you know, L3 legacy network, right? Probably you have your DHCP servers here. So you want to have kind of like a connectivity from your, you know, fabric to your DHCP network and so on. So this is again, uh, again, like I said, uh, fusion is probably you don't see a lot of it in every single um, network, right? Uh, but it's, it's good to have, right? Uh, so, uh, since I'm discussing all the various components, right, uh, I just thought maybe I'll talk about everything as well. So, like I said, right, if it's a small network, then I would not even want the different devices to have different roles. I could probably use a single device and kind of like, you know, make a single device as the edge and border and control and fusion, right? Possible, right? If I have like, let's say a very, very small network. But if I have a big network, then probably I would want to divide it into different roles and do something like this right so yeah now along with this whole piece there are going to be two other interesting things which are going to be there in your uh, SDA is basically your uh, ice and your WLC right so I think I have a picture here that's good right so uh, this is all what we have discussed till now right we looked into uh, the control plane node we looked into the uh, uh, border nodes right which helps you go in and out of the fabric we talked about the edge node which are basically access switches and uh, you know the intermediate nodes are basically the underlay network right the probably the backbone of your enterprise network whatever uh, probably is running is has right let's assume um, <clears throat> now what we are talking is the identity services the ice right uh, i think people who work with security uh, before might be familiar with ice right so ICE helps you do a lot of things in the network, right? It helps you do things like AAA, right? Authentication, authorization, and accounting, right? It helps you do TrustSec, right? Or in simple terms, you can call that SGT. We'll discuss this later, but it helps you do that. And that's, again, one of the most important part or most important component of my SDA, right? Because it helps you do a lot of segmentation in your network. And this, again, ties back to what I told earlier, right? How we are trying to do identity-based segmentation right and not ip based or vlan based so this helps a lot in that regard the sgt part right uh, people call that in different names some people say security group tags some people call it as scalable group tags but it's the same technology right so ice helps you do this right it does helps you do the authentication part and then assign and do policing and do security policies based on these sgts right so that's the reason of having ice here the other one you, you would have seen here is your fabric uh, wireless controller, right, WLC. Because you have all of these uh, access points connecting to your network, right, and they need to have some kind of a mechanism to register to your WLC. And all the provisioning of access points happens using the WLC, right. So that's why they have retained the WLC in the SDA network as well, right. So, I mean, you might have a question. We already have a, you know, DNAX, a DNA center or the whole centralized control happening and the centralized management happening here so why do we even need a wireless controller because they have retained it because because of that main reason because WLC is uh, pretty good and they it's a uh, it's a product which has been there for many years and uh, when it comes to provisioning your APs when it comes to pushing down policy in, into your APs you know uh, your WLC is doing the job so but again right uh, you don't have to manually go and do anything on the WLC 
right once is once it is integrated in your fabric once it is discovered in your fabric right the D dna is the only place where you have to do anything right sitting here sitting on your uh, uh, right the person sitting here is can do every single uh, you know configuration every single policy definition everything can be done sitting here on your dna right so dna is going to internally work with your eyes it's going to internally work with your wlc to get you the final outcome but right you don't have to do anything right uh, you also would have seen a couple of things here like DNA automation, assurance. These are like various components inside your DNA center, right, relating to your insights, right, the earlier stuff which I was talking about, the clients 360, the, uh, you know, device 360 views and all of that, right, which we probably will not discuss much here because it's just a GUI, right, at the end of the day. Uh, the technology is mainly down here, right, how all of this comes into uh, one piece. So, that's, that's your whole components part of your ST access right so now I think we can dwell into some interesting concepts right of your whole uh, ST access solution right so when I talk about concepts the first thing which I would like to talk is my uh, any cast address right any cast address I think you guys would have already heard right um, you know in a network world it's a pretty common um, this thing so any cast address by definition is basically when a when multiple devices seem to have the same IP address right then you call that address as any cast address so in case of SDA this is used widely right and I'll tell you why right so let's put a very simple you know fabric like I was doing earlier I'm pretty bad with my drawing so uh, forgive me for that so let's assume these are my edge nodes right let's have like three edge nodes over here right Let's not even talk about the border control because you know forget it forget them for a minute let's assume that we have three edge nodes and you have users here right let's assume we have kind of like uh, the wireless users right um, let's assume we have a wireless user here and we have a gateway right so for every every user you need to have a gateway on this edge device right now uh, because these are all uh, switches right the gateways are generally SVIs, right? You create a VLAN and you assign an IP address, right? That's basically a SVI. So you have SVIs over here. Now in SD access, what they did was they kind of replicated or they copied the same gateway on all the devices, right? What I mean is, let's assume I have probably two pools of devices, right? We have 10.1.50.0 and we have 10.1.60.0. Right. Let's say we have two pools, right, of uh, two network pools, right. Two two pools where the IP addresses are going to be assigned, right. Let's assume this is like twenty four slash twenty four. Now, the gateway of this, let's say, is ten dot one dot fifty dot two fifty four, right. And here it's going to be ten dot one dot sixty dot two fifty four, right. So what they did was, in SDA, you have so this is your gateway, right? 254, right? This is your gateway. So these gateways are configured on all the switches. So you have the two address over here. You will have them here and you will have them here, right? Now, how is this helping? How is this helping is when a host, right, which is behind this edge right now, when it is moving from here to let's say here, right? So the host is here now. They don't have to change their default gateway, right? It would be pretty bad if they have to like literally you know change the default gateway when they move from one host to host Let, imagine you are on a voice call you're on a uh, you know video call with someone right and you would want that to happen seamlessly right so this is pretty amazing so they have the gateway the same addresses configured the same gateway addresses configured on all this all the edge edge devices so as a result when you move from one you know edge device to the other right you would still use the same gateway right and it will kind of like authenticate you and assign you an IP address and all of that but you know you you don't have to manually do anything and you know the seamless transfer happens right mainly very very useful if you are talking about a video or a voice kind of a uh, you know uh, this thing so this is your any cast right so this is a very interesting concept which is used in my SDA any cast gateways is what I would call this right great next the next concept again is not something very new like i said right this anycast is also it's been there for a long while it's not something new right 
Similarly, the next one which we are talking is your uh, VNs or virtual network. Now, if people have already know what is a VRFS, this is literally a VRFS, nothing different, right? It's as simple as that, right? So you have a you have your uh, fabric here, right? You have this fabric, and you on the control plane you want to kind of like segregate right you know the basic concept of a vrf right in in case of when you have a router with the it's basically dividing a router or a device into multiple other devices or multiple routers right so when you have a vrf you have a separate global routing table and then you have a vrf routing table because you don't want the routes you know to kind of move out of your vrf right the whole um, understanding about vrf so VRF or in this case the virtual networks, you know, it maintains a separate routing table right for each instance, right? So it's going to be something like this. So you have let's say uh, HR Right in your in your let's say your enterprise network has probably HR IT and uh, Let's say you have a guest network Right, so you wouldn't obviously want people who are getting connected to your guests Let's say some visitors you wouldn't want them to like access the resources from your IT or you wouldn't want them to access the resources from HR right so that's where you know we kind of create your virtual networks right and we will see how all of this comes together later when we uh, you know talk about the provisioning and the uh, you know packet trace but this is a very this is again a concept you know which is widely used in my SD access fabric right so as simple as that this virtual, uh, virtual network um, and and the other thing is probably uh, you know every single host which connects to a particular uh, you know virtual network right it is going to be routed and advertised inside that particular virtual network endpoints right so let's say you have an endpoint connecting to your hr right over here and you have another uh, you know guy coming in and connecting here so they both will be able to talk because it's the same vrf but at the same time you'll not be able to talk with the other vrf or the other virtual network right again pretty simple what else? Um, let's also talk about your scalable groups. Scalable groups, right? Um, let me put it down here. So I want to talk about this um, a little more in detail because this probably uh, is very important, you know, in case of uh, ST access. Uh, so the security folks, right? If there are any security folks, they probably would have already heard of uh, SGT, right? Security group tagging. It's the same thing as scalable groups right uh, <clears throat> I mean uh, this this again this technology has been there quite some time right um, uh, probably few seven to eight years but it's, it was the security people who are using it and that's why they kind of named it as or they started calling it as security group tagging uh, but and the same thing in in STA we basically call it as scalable groups scalable group tagging right so now <clears throat> or or even you know uh, you would have also heard people calling it as trust sec Right. All of these are kind of like the same technology. You need not, uh, you know, uh, go and research uh, all of these because it's all the same. Right. TrustSec is another name which people give it. Right. Great. So now, what does it actually do? Like if you look at the older way of, you know, defining policies in your network, it was using your ACLs. Right. It was using your um, ACLs where, you know, you, uh, you define your... Uh, IP addresses for your endpoints or the resources and kind of like put in your permit and deny statements and uh, That's that's like a huge amount of manual work, right? So how does it actually look right you you probably have uh, let's say a Switch or an edge node here. You have an edge node here, right? Um, and you know, this is the network Right, so let's assume that you have kind of like a um, you know client sitting here a trusted client right assume that this guy is trusted and let's say you kind of have an hacker coming in through here right a bad person right let's call him untrusted right probably why is using his mobile phone or whatever or another laptop whatever right but you know you have a trusted and untrusted kind of a network like like I said earlier you know if you had to protect your trusted client from such a untrusted source you probably had to you know define what the ACLs right you had to put a ACL saying that okay uh, deny you know this particular IP address let's say this 10.1.1.1 and this is kind of like 
10.2.2.2 so you have to put a access list saying deny you know this IP address that's 10.1 to 10.2 probably on a particular application right uh, the application or the port number whatever it is. that used to be the way now this is again this is not very scalable right because you um, you know every time a new IP address is discovered or you have a new IP address you have to keep on writing such rules right now scalable uh, groups or trust sec or STT kind of prevents this from happening so the whole the center of this whole is your eyes right the eyes basically sits here and it's the eyes which basically obviously authenticates right a user into the network right so what happens is that when the user comes in let's say in this case you know an untrusted user comes in a tag is given right a tag I mean obviously it is also it can also provide you IP address and all of that required for the routing part but from the identity perspective it will give you a tag right so the tag is going to be you know let's say a, a simple number right let's assume the tag is 15 over here right so this guy gets a tag of 15 and how did the how did how did this user get the tag it is based on the authentication right uh, based on based on the profiles which are configured right the authentication profiles which are configured on your eyes right you can you can define the rules here saying that you know if a user comes in via dot one x right coming from a the coming from this particular IP IP pool or coming from here right give it a particular tag so it gives a tag and you also have a tag coming in for the trusted user as well right let's say 16 right so now no longer you have to write your access policies using your IP addresses rather you can simply you know kind of translate the uh, earlier ACL but in using SGTs or using these tags right now how is this useful you don't have to repeatedly or manually sit and write ACLs for every single IP address because this tag is going to be the same right whenever an untrusted user comes in the tag is going to be 15 and a trusted user comes in it's going to be 16 so your one single you know SGT one single ACL which you write using this SGT is going to apply across right isn't that amazing so now you can simply write deny right deny 15 to 16 right on say some um, you know uh, let's say ICMP you want to deny ICMP so you can deny like this right I mean this is not exactly the syntax but I'm just giving you an example right so this kind of helps a lot um, you know to to prevent and make the uh, policies all of that very scalable less amount of work right now this is the technology which is being used where in my um, SDI as well right but again like I said you don't have to go and configure any of this on ice right your your, if I go to my previous picture here, your whole configuration, right? Your whole, uh, let's say, management of the whole network happens on your, you know, DNAC over here, right? So that in the backend it has been integrated, or it has, it has, it would have already discovered your eyes, right? So on on DNAC, you just go and do, you know, any management kind of configuration, and that gets translated, you know, in into the eyes, or that gets translated into the wireless control right so if this is going to be a single place or one place one stop shop for doing anything in your SDX, right so even your SGT related configuration and defining the policies right the the policy which I just you know wrote here right all of these policies like this one all of that gets written down where on my DNAC and then gets pushed down to my access nodes uh, or the edge nodes right where these policies are applied right so that's an interesting concept which I want to double click as well Right, the I think we have covered most of concept. Like I will obviously not go and talk about in detail about the protocols like Lisp and VXLAN. Right, so this would obviously take another two hours just to talk about these protocols. Uh, but uh, I would you know recommend you guys to just um, you know search on the internet for these two protocols. Well, these are the two important protocols which are kind of like used in the fabric, which I will talk next. But I'll probably obviously not dig deeper into the protocol, the RFC of it. Um, you know, I would leave it up to the viewers to uh, get a hold on it. Uh, VXLAN is a uh, is a fam pretty famous protocol used in the data center side, and Lisp is as well. Um, it's been around, I would say, for another seven eight years. Right? Uh, again, goes back to my earlier discussion that nothing in SDA is something you know uh, something new. It's not SLAN and Lisp more in detail in the subsequent sections. But for now, what do we do? Let's. Uh, Let's talk about uh, two important concepts, right? Before we move ahead, one is your underlay, and the other one is your overlay, right? 
I'm pretty sure you guys would have heard this in the networking world a lot, but I just wanted to brush the concept here. So overlay network is actually a logical topology, right? This one, the overlay is generally a logical topology which tries to you know, virtually connect two devices, what? Using your underlay, right? So if I take an example, I think you guys would have done this configuration quite a lot. If I take two routers, R1, R2, and probably let's say we have a internet over here, right? So <coughs> you would have done a GRE configuration here, right? GRE tunnel configuration between these two edges. I'm pretty sure you would have done this. So this is a very good example of your underlay and overlay. So what is happening here is GRE is virtually trying to connect these two endpoints using a physical network over here, which is available between those both. Right. So here in this example, GRE was my what? Overlay and the internet or the physical connectivity was my underlay. Right. So in case of my SD access as well, I have the same technique or I have the same, uh, you know, terms. So I have my underlay, I have my overlay. Right, but I'm not much concerned of my underlay because it's generally like ISIS protocol, right? What we are more concerned is the overlay because the SD access solution itself is an overlay solution, right? The whole thing which you are doing over your existing network. So that's why, you know, you might have heard people saying that SD access doesn't change anything, you know, with respect to your existing infrastructure. You can use, your still, you can still use your existing routing protocols and all of that in your core, right? But SD access just provides an overlay, you know, to... Um, you know provide that whole STN flavor to it, right? So what we are going to talk now in the next few uh, I think uh, sections of this video is we're going to talk about this overlay, right? Now this overlay is what we actually refer to as the fabric Right, this is what you refer to as the fabric now whenever we talk about Any protocol we have what we always have two important things which we discuss we discuss the control plane then we discuss the data plane, right? But in case of SD access, there is actually another plane, which is the policy plane, right? Kind of like um, uh, created, you know, just for this purpose, right? So these are like three important pieces which we have to talk, right? Awesome. So in case of my uh, SD access, right? So the control, the control plane is done by what? I think we talked about this earlier. The protocol is the LISP protocol, right? Location identity separation protocol, right? <clears throat> so, Lisp. Let's talk a little more about Lisp. For Lisp, um, it was it's a it was developed as a routing protocol, right? To start with, right? Let me go to a new sheet here. So we are talking a little bit about Lisp here. So it was developed as a um, routing protocol, right? If you look at your traditional right uh, routing protocols, right? Let's say you have a router R one. R2 and your R3 here, they are connected like this, right? You have networks behind them and all of that. So in case of your traditional routing table, how does it look? You always have, you have, uh, right, you have a prefix, right? And you have the next hop, right? This is a traditional routing table, right? So to go to X, um, to go to the X network, you got to take the Y as the next hop, right? So in case of my uh, traditional this is my traditional network, traditional routing, right? In case of traditional routing, you see the IP address, the IP address represents both my location and identity in my, in my network, right? It's the only identifier. So both my location and identity is represented by the, uh, you know, location plus the identity. Who I am and where I am, both are located by you know, by my IP address, there is no separation, right? But when we talk about Lisp, the same, probably put in router one, two, and three, right? So we have this, but what we do is we actually end up creating a mapping server here. Let's call MP for now. And all these guys are connected to the mapping server, right? And the routers here, you know, the local routers will still retain, will still obviously have the prefix and the next stop table, right? But it's going to be only for the local routes, right? And they won't have the routes for the whole network, right? They're going to have only the local routes here. Whereas the mapping server, right? Or the control plane node, right? In case of my, uh, you know, in the SD access terminology I've talked earlier, right? It's the control plane node basically, or the mapping server. What it will do is that this is where you're, it's going to create your mapping for every single client, right? Which is in your network for every single, 
client right so it's going to be the table here is going to be something like this it's going to have a prefix and it's going to have something called as a R lock right R lock is generally in simple terms it's just a loopback address of any of these edge routers right so for example let's say I have a client here which is 10.1.1.1 so this guy will have a mapping saying that 10.1.1 can be found behind the edge which is this edge 3 right and this h3 obviously the r lock is going to be the loop address loopback address of h3 right so what are we doing here is that if you see here earlier right in in a traditional network uh, the location and the identity identity were all submerged inside the ip but in this case what i'm doing is that i'm clearly separating my um, location from the identity identity right my location is basically this one right the h3 whereas my identity is 10.1.1. So we are clearly separating the location from the uh, identity in case of Lisp, right? Now, how is this all benefiting? Is because in case of a traditional network, let's say a small change in the clients, right? Let's say this client which is here is moving over here. The whole routing table has to reconverge, right? The whole network has to reconverge. But in this case, you know, you don't have that much of a CPU, um, you know, reconvergence happening because like I said, right the when, whenever a client changes right we, we don't have the whole routing table under this router right and only the mapping server this is the guy who is going to you know where there will be a lot of cpu churn and all of that happening but you know i don't have to go and like completely you know reconverge my whole uh, you know uh, routing here uh, in case of a uh, lisp right so that is why that is why we are using lisp in case of sd access right we are we are moving away from this tradition and using lisp mainly because of that reason we are using Lisp as the controlled plane protocol for what? For my overlay, for my fabric, right? Like we discussed here in the earlier, uh, you know, section, right? We are using Lisp over here, and that is the reason. Now moving ahead, where what is the data plane? The data plane in case of my, uh, uh, in case of my what? Um, SD access is my VXLAN. Again, uh, data center technology, right? We probably would have heard of this before. So. Yeah, so we're using VXLAN. Again, couple of notes here, why we are using VXLAN, I'm not going to obviously explain the whole VXLAN technology, but why are we using this, right? So if you look at the payloads, right? Or if you look at the packet, so this is generally your payload, right? And remember, we are using VXLAN for the data plane. So this is your payload, then you generally have your IP, then you have your ethernet header, right? This is how your normal packet looks like, original packet. But because of your Lisp, right, we talked earlier, the Lisp control plane, how does it look? It's going to be this, it's going to be, this is going to be same. You're going to have the payload, you're going to have the IP. But when you, when you talk about Lisp, it basically ends up removing the Ethernet, right? And instead of that, it ends up putting a Lisp header, right? Because for a control plane perspective, I really don't want the MAC address. All the MAC information, I don't want that, so I remove it, right? Then obviously, there is going to be, the outside, you know, uh, header which is going to be like a UDP packet, and uh, outside you will have another IP and the Ethernet, right? So this is the outside part, right? Generally the the R lock part which I was talking, right? That's uh, that's that's how it's going to be for a Lisp packet. Now going one step ahead, let's talk about the VXLAN packet. How does that look like? So you still have your, you know, payload, right? You have the payload, you have your IP, right? But in case of VXLAN, we retain the Ethernet, which we had removed, right? This one, we retain it. We retain it here. That's the main difference between your Lisp and the VXLAN packet, right? Uh, and uh, on top of that, obviously, this is the control plane. This is a data plane. But I still wanted to, you know, call this out clearly. The main difference is that the Ethernet is still retained, right? And you'll get to know why we are retaining it because, you know, because once the packet gets decapsulated, you really need to know what MAC address you have to go and give this packet to. So we are retaining the this thing so obviously outside this we are going to have the vx lan header then the same thing as above right the udp uh, you know the outer outer ip and the ethernet and all of that right so this is this is how the packet looks so the main reason why you're using vx lan is because vx lan keeps the ethernet header right unlike the other protocols so vx lan packet is decapsulated at the destination r lock and we can then you know kind of like send the packet to the right mac right so that's one of the reason Right, let me put it here because it is retaining the ethernet that is why we are using the other reason is because 
you know, for the policy plane, right? What is a policy plane? We are talking here the policy plane. The policy plane is basically nothing but your SGT and your VN information, right? The virtual network and the SGT, which we have discussed earlier, right? So this information has to be pushed down, right? Um, you know, will be pushed down to the edge nodes and this information will be carried in the packet, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to make some decision, you have to make some access policies or routing decisions based on this policy. Otherwise, the policy is of no use. So you have to really carry this SGT information in your network, right? So that information also is carried by what? By your VXLAN, right? So inside this VXLAN header, which I was talking here, you will have the SGT information and the virtual network information, right? Carried. So that is the reason why we are using the uh, VXLAN network, right? Great. So I think I don't have to again talk about the policy because like I said, the policy plane is basically nothing but your SGT and the virtual network information, right? So I think that makes it very clear about the fabric. Just to recap, you have fabric, uh, which is the overlay network in case of your ST access. The underlay is generally like a ISIS protocol, normal routing protocol. Now in case of uh, the fabric, we have the control plane, which is the LISP. Data plane is the VXLAN and the policy plane is generally your SGT and the virtual VN IDs, which we talked earlier. We use LISP because, you know, it's less CPU intensive. It uses a mapping server and it kind of exactly does what its name suggests, right? It separates the location from the identity, you know, um, it's a location identity separation protocol, right? And uh, you will keep on hearing RLOC references, which I will again talk later when we do the packet trace. But that is the main reason we are using this because you don't want the whole network to undergo a routing change whenever a client moves. Rather you know, do all the changes probably at a centralized place like a mapping server or a control plane node and then push down those changes back to the edge. Two reasons which we talked earlier uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, the other one is the uh, SGT and the VN. 